Hey everyone, and welcome to the Zero Tech. I'm Daniel, and the iPhone has always had a small screen size. Take a look at this thing, iPhone 4X, 3.5 inches. This thing is small. Yeah. Now, when Steve Jobs introduced the original iPhone back in 2007, the iPhone actually had a massive display compared to what was on the market at that time. So, with a 3.5 inches display, the first generation iPhone was actually what we call a phablet today. Yeah, the original iPhone was the phablet of 2007. That's how huge the iPhone was and how small, you know, the other phones, their displays were. Yeah, the iPhone was a phablet back in 2007. But then something changed. In 2010, Samsung announced their own iPhone, the Samsung Galaxy S, the first generation S device. This is the Galaxy S. Today's launching will be historically memorable moment in the future smartphone business. So the Galaxy S was at first an affordable version of the iPhone. It ran Android 2.1 or Eclair and it was the iPhone's main competitor. Not just because of its low price, high in specs, operating system, app market and what you could do with it, but also because of its display. So the Samsung Galaxy S came with a massive 4 inches display, way bigger than what we got with Apple's iPhone which was only 3.5 inches, but Samsung didn't stop there. The following year, they introduced the Galaxy S2, then a year after, the Galaxy S3. This is the moment the world has been waiting for, the Samsung Galaxy S3. Then the Galaxy S4, which I have in my hand at the moment, and then the Galaxy S5, which is their latest model. And with each version of the Galaxy S series, the screen got even bigger. They started with a 4 inch display back in 2010 and now the Galaxy S5 comes in at 5.1 inches. But Samsung didn't stop there. Samsung loves experimenting and that's what they do best. They keep launching new phones and see which one attracts, you know, more customers and so on. And in 2011 they did something, they did something pretty cool. They introduced something which would reinvent what we call Fabless today. That's because in 2011 Samsung created the Fablet itself and they called it the Galaxy Note. And same as with the Galaxy S series, each version of the Galaxy Note lineup came with an even larger display. The current gen Galaxy Note 4 comes with a massive 5.7 inch display, yeah, 5.7, which pushes the limit of what a portable smartphone can be. Now Apple on the other hand did nothing like this. Steve Jobs actually stated you cannot get your hand around this, no one's gonna buy that. That's what he said and apparently, well, he was wrong. He also said that Apple will never make large screen smartphones or tablets. In 2012, however, they introduced the iPhone 5, which bumped the screen size from 3.5 inches to 4 inches. Not a huge increase, but still, at least it was one. However, the iPhone was still small. Last year's iPhone 5S looked like a toy when compared to other phones from HTC, LG, Samsung and Motorola. But in 2014, in September, actually two months ago, they did something which shocked pretty much pretty much everyone at least everyone who hasn't seen the mock-ups or or the leaks so they introduced the brand new iphone 6 which came with a massive 4.7 inch display at least massive for apple but still smaller than the competition such as the galaxy s5 the HTC one and mate and so on but they didn't stop there no they didn't they introduced the second iphone and they called it the iphone 6 Plus, which came with a ridiculous 5.5 inches display, almost as big as the 5.7 inches of the Note 4. Apple has now entered the phablet realm, one which they said they'll never enter. Therefore, this is my in-depth review of Apple's first gen phablet, the iPhone 6 Plus. Enjoy. Starting off with the design, just like the iPhone 6, the 6 Plus features an all new design. And when you hold it in your hand, you notice immediately that it's not just extremely thin, but also extremely light. In fact, at only 172 grams, it is so light that it actually feels as if you were holding a cheap plastic phone in your hand, although this is definitely not a case. In terms of the thickness, the 6 Plus comes in at only 7.1 millimeters thick. This makes it the thinnest phablet on the market right now, being just 0.2 millimeters thicker than the iPhone 6. In fact, it is so thin that the camera protrudes about a millimeter from the back. Now, since it has a sapphire crystal lens cover, you don't have to worry about scratching it when placing it on a table. However, what you do have to worry about is wobbling. So if you're the guy who usually types while your phone is flat on a table, well, you can forget that. Since the iPhone 6 Plus and even the 6 will wobble. 
However, you can solve this pretty easily with a case. Pretty good example would be Apple's leather case, which would cost you £39 in UK or $50 in US. It has the camera protrusion, so you can now type while your phone is resting flat on a table. And it also reduces the slipperiness of your iPhone. Which I do have to say, thin phone, round edges and aluminum build will most probably drop after only a few hours of usage. But hey, a case will fix this issue. Just like the 6, the 6 Plus is an incredibly solid phone. Full unibody aluminum build, one of the best constructed phones out there. In fact, the only phone that can match the iPhone's build quality is the HTC One M8. They're both extremely beautiful crafted, although in my opinion the One M8 does have a sexier design, but that's just a matter of taste. In fact, if you take a look at the back of those phones, you'll see that they're really similar. They both come with this beautiful aluminum build, and they both have those lines, those weird lines on the top and on the bottom. So what exactly are they? Well, they're called antenna gaps and they're something which we need in a phone, at least as of today. Now Wi-Fi can pass through aluminium or aluminum, but 3G, Edge, 4G and all that kind of stuff, they need a less denser material, such as plastic like we had with the iPhone 5C or glass like we had with the iPhone 4, 4S, 5 or 5S. That's why we had those glass bars on the top and on the bottom of the device. So yeah, we need glass or plastic and those lines, those antenna gaps are made out of plastic. That's that's why we need them. We need those for the signal for 3G, Edge and 4G signals to pass through. So yeah, at the moment we we need those. But here's what bothers me. On the HTC One M8 those lines are extremely thin. In fact, the thickness of the lines matches the thickness of the HTC logo. Whereas on the iPhone they're at least 5 to 6 times thicker than the iPhone logo and they don't even match the color of your phone. I know, they look as if someone got a permanent marker and drew them on the back of your iPhone. They look, they look horrible and they ruin something which could have been the best designed phone the planet but then again I'm a perfectionist myself so I tend everything to be as perfect as possible. So that would be my number one complaint at least in terms of the design. And speaking of my complaints the second complaint I have about this phone is or are the bezels. The bezels of this phone. They're they're huge. So the iPhone 6 Plus comes with a massive 5.5 inches display but here's the interesting part. The iPhone 6 Plus is actually taller than most devices with the same screen size or in some cases it's actually taller than some devices which have an even larger display such as the Galaxy Note 4 which comes with a 5.7 inch display and still the iPhone 6 Plus is it's taller than the Galaxy Note 4 although it has a smaller screen size that's that's only because of those bezels so again it's taller than the Galaxy Note 4 taller than the OnePlus One which comes with the same 5.5 inch display and way taller than the LG G3 which again comes with a 5.5 inch display this is mainly because of the home button which takes up a lot of space and then we need a matching bar at the top both of which heavily increase the size of this phone and speaking of the home button same as with last year's iPhone 5s the iPhone 6 and 6 plus they both come with a touch ID sensor or a fingerprint reader built right into the home button this means that you can unlock your iPhone by simply using your fingerprint, you can pay for apps in the App Store, and now with the latest iOS 8.1 update you can even use Apple Pay, which replaces the need to carry around multiple credit cards. Okay, your total is 2378. That's it! Fortunately, Apple Pay only works in the US at the moment, but hopefully that's going to change next year. So Samsung's unlocking approach implies you to swipe your finger vertically and most of the times it didn't even work. But the best part about Touch ID is that it works. It works no matter how you hold your finger. You can hold it upside down, you can hold it on the side, you can hold it for 5 seconds or just for a single second. All of this doesn't matter because it will always work. This is by far the best fingerprint solution on the market, for a smartphone at least. And yeah, it even works with just the tip of your finger. And besides all this, you can add up to 5 fingers or any other body parts if you if you wish. Yeah, it works with pretty much everything. Not that I've tried it, I'm, I'm just saying. Now moving on to the display, I do have to say it is one of the best displays I have ever seen on a phone. It's a 5.5 inch display now with a resolution of 1920 by 1080, so full 1080p here, coming in at 441 ppi, which is actually Apple's highest pixel density display. Obviously not as high as LG G3's or Note 4's 2K display, but that doesn't matter because you won't be able to see the pixels anyway, not even when up close. But the question is, is it crisper than the iPhone 6's 326 ppi, because remember this is for 41. Well, if you look extremely up close, probably 1 to 2 centimeters from the screen, then yes, you will be able to tell the difference. Otherwise, from a normal viewing distance, 
No, they look they look identical. Now here's a cool thing, the display and the digitizer are now laminated into the glass. Now I've mentioned and demoed this in my iPad Air 2 video, so in case you haven't seen that video, boom, here's the video and I've included a link in the description box down below. So what does this all mean, the laminated stuff? Well, it means that number one, there's no air gap between the display the glass and the digitizer and in case you don't know the digitizer is basically the touch screen yeah so there's no air gap between those three since they're all just one piece and two this is the most immersive display you will ever see on a phone it actually feels like you were touching the pixels. And what is more, the glass itself is now curved around the edges, creating this seamless screen and edge design. So when you're using the phone, especially navigating with those back and forward slide gestures, it is going to feel amazing, as if the iPhone 6 and 6 Plus were designed especially for those back and forward gestures. The viewing angles are amazing, even better than on the iPhone 5S, since Apple now switched to dual domain pixels for wider viewing angles. They also included a new polarizing filter to make it even more visible outdoors, especially in direct sunlight. And I do have to say, it is completely usable outdoors. You can do anything from reading text to watching videos all in direct sunlight. This is by far the best outdoor experience I have ever had on a phone. So if you're the kind of guy who likes to go out every day and use this in extremely bright sunlight, then you're most probably going to fall in love with this phone. But that's not just it, Apple also increased the contrast ratio from 800, what we had on the iPhone 5s, to 1300 to 1 on the iPhone 6 Plus, and 1400 to 1 on the iPhone 6. So yeah, the iPhone 6 does come with a higher contrast, which is, which is a bit weird. But at the same time, they're true to life, and with that 5.5 inch display, the iPhone 6 Plus is perfect for watching videos, viewing photos, editing them, and more importantly, taking them. So speaking of taking them, the iPhone 6 Plus comes with the exact same camera as the iPhone 6. So you get an 8 megapixel sensor, f2.2 aperture, 5 element lens and all that kind of stuff which really sounds, which sounds really great on paper but in reality, well, it's even better. So in terms of the photos, they look great. Actually, not just great but incredible. The exposure is simply perfect, none of my shots were over or underexposed, the HDR mode is again perfect, I mean just take a look at those shots, they look they look incredible. The nighttime shots look even more impressive, they look as if they were taken with a professional DSLR camera. And here's why, the iPhone 6 Plus comes with something that the iPhone 6 is missing, and that is optical image stabilization. So optical image stabilization or OIS is hardware based unlike the one you get with the iPhone 6, which is software based. And that one's called Digital Image Stabilization, or DIS. So the built-in gyroscope talks to the camera optics, which adjusts the lens in accordance to the movement of your hands. So this means three things. Number one is that even if you have shaky hands, your photos are still going to look really crisp. Then number two, since your hand's shakiness is greatly reduced, the shutter speed can actually be decreased, which translates to some really impressive nighttime shots. And finally, number three is that the videos are going to look amazing. So here's a video from an iPhone 4S, which doesn't come with optical image stabilization or any kind of stabilization for that matter. And now, here's the same video taken with the iPhone 6 Plus. So as you can see, the difference is huge, and that was while walking. While standing still, the difference is even greater. With the iPhone 6 Plus, it looks as if I was filming this with a tripod when as a matter of fact, I, I wasn't. So quite impressive results here, especially for videographers. And of course, besides all this, you have that insane 240 frames per second slow motion video, you also get time lapse capabilities, and you can even take panoramas in up to 43 megapixels in size. Yeah, 43 megapixels. And the software stitches them up pretty good into this seamless photo, so there's no way you can tell the stitching points. These are one of the best panoramas that, you know, a phone can, can take. The front facing camera has also been upgraded to an f2.2 aperture with the same age resolution for video, so yeah, a lot of great features. But a key feature about this camera is that it's fast, like really fast. You can take it out of your pocket and in less than 3 seconds you have already taken that shot. And the reason for this is that it now focuses incredibly fast, it now uses something called focus pixels or phase detection autofocus. This is something extremely advanced which only the high-end DSLR cameras have. The Canon C100 and Canon 70D would be some pretty good examples. This means that your iPhone will focus in less than a second. Less than a second, that's, that's really fast. And guess what, Apple even removed the yellow autofocusing square since it actually takes longer for the animation to appear than for the iPhone to focus. And this is why this is the best smartphone camera that you can get, not just because it's quick, but also because 
is consistent. No matter how much or how less light I had, how fast or how slow I took the shots, all the photos were perfectly exposed and incredibly crisp. The iPhone 6 and 6 Plus actually use a pretty high shutter speed whenever you take a photo in order to reduce any motion blur. Then they also increase the ISO in order to compensate that and then finally the advanced image processing does a pretty good job cleaning up that image. And everything is done in less than a second. Amazing. Performance is again really impressive on the iPhone 6 Plus. It now comes with an all new Apple A8 CPU, which is now a 20 nanometer process. And combined with iOS 8, it is basically the most fluid experience you can get on a smartphone. Everything is buttery smooth, apps launch in less than a second, games run and look great, especially on this massive 5.5 inch display. So everything about a 6 Plus in terms of performance is simply pristine. Now in terms of the operating system, with a brand new iOS 8 we get things like Healthbook, which is basically the main hub for all of your health app info, and we finally get third party keyboards, such as SwiftKey for example. And then we also get third party widgets. So yeah, we finally have widgets on iOS, right in the notification center. Now this is a bit different than on Android where you basically have them anywhere you want on the home screen. I know, actually like Apple's approach, makes iOS much more usable, for me at least. By the way, let me know in the comment section down below if you prefer Google's or Apple's approach when it comes to widgets. But honestly, the best part about iOS 8 has to be continuity. So if you have another Apple device such as a Mac, an iPad or another iPhone, whenever you do some work on one of them, you can simply pick up the other device and continue the work from there. So you can start an email on your Mac and continue it on your iPad or iPhone. Start a keynote presentation on your Mac and continue it on your phone. Start browsing from your Mac and open up the same Safari web page on your iPad and yeah, you get the idea. Everything with just a simple slide of your finger and that's that's just it. But by far the coolest continuity feature is sending and receiving phone calls right on your Mac. So if you have your iPhone nearby and you're connected to the same Wi-Fi network and have Bluetooth turned on, whenever you get a call on your iPhone, it will be forwarded to your Mac or iPad. And from there, you can simply use your Mac speaker and mic to listen and speak to the person who called you. Just watch this. Hello? Cool, I'm talking to myself. So, there we go, this is continuity. This is how cool it is. So I can answer phone calls directly from my Mac and yeah, this is how it is, this is continuity. And um, I know, I'm simply talking to myself. This is how cool it is. Yeah, there we go. Continuity in iOS 8 and Yosemite. And yes, you guessed it, this works on text messages as well. So let me just try and send a text message to this guy, Zone of Tech, I wonder who this guy is. So, sub zone. How's it going? Do you you want a free pizza? And press end. And there you go, we got a reply right on my phone. There you go, the whole message which was written from my Mac. So you can pretty much send any text message you want to pretty much anyone, any phone number right from your Mac or iPad or any iOS device as long as you have an iPhone with iOS 8 and obviously Yosemite. So let me just type in reply. Whoops, Pipa, I am not sure if you are looking for a woman. Send. <laughs> there we go. Whoops. Sending, and we got a text message. There we go. PPP, I'm not sure if you are looking for a woman. <laughs> so there we go. Continuity works, and it's awesome. Now, what about my dislikes? Well, I've mentioned the huge bezels, I've mentioned the protruding camera on the back, and I've also mentioned the antenna gaps, the huge, annoying, ugly antenna gaps on the back of the phone. But what annoys me the most is that you have this huge 5.5 inch display, and unlike the Galaxy Note 4, for example, which comes with some pretty cool tricks up its sleeve, such as multi-window multitasking, picture-in-picture -picture mode, even a really useful one such as this one-handed mode. However, with the iPhone 6 Plus, you get nothing. The OS is basically just a blown up iPhone 6 interface, and, and that's just it. The only things that are different from the iPhone 6 is that a home screen now rotates. Yay! And besides this, some of the stock apps have this iPad-like style, which does give you a bit of more screen real estate. But other than that, there's literally nothing. And in terms of the one-handed mode that the Note 4 comes with, Apple's approach is called reachability. So what this does is that it brings the whole user interface down when you double-tap the home button, making it a bit easier to reach the top bits. 
However, this will obviously not work when typing, and the trick is that you have to be touching the capacitive ring because that's the one which recognizes the touches, and not a home button because, you know, the home button doesn't do anything itself. So in conclusion, it will not always work, only, let's say, 8 out of 10 times. The speaker is also a bit of a disappointment. You get a single speaker, so no, you do not get stereo sound from this, and it is positioned on the bottom of the phone, which means that if you cover it by mistake, you won't be able to hear a thing, especially since it's a single speaker. And trust me, it's not a difficult to cover, especially while watching movies. The good side, however, is that the speaker is quite loud, although there's no way you can compare this to something like the HTC One Mate, not in terms of the loudness and definitely not in terms of the sound quality. There's also no 4K video recording at this time, although that would have looked absolutely insane, especially on that 5K Retina iMac. So I'm hoping that 4K will come next year with the iPhone 6 Plus S, or with the S Plus 6, what? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> We'll see. Just a quick note, 4K is actually 8.3 megapixels in size, and since the iPhone sensor is 8 megapixels in size, since the iPhone 4S basically, well, that's why we don't have 4K video recording yet. So, yeah. So by now, you've probably noticed that I haven't said anything about the band gate. So, does it bend? Well, short answer, no. Unless you intentionally try to bend it, or you sit on it, or you put a lot of pressure on it, it will not blend. Long answer, I'm actually working on a video just on that, should be up in a couple of weeks, so be sure to hit that like button down there if you're interested in seeing that video. Finally, in terms of the battery, the iPhone 6 Plus comes with a 2915 mAh battery, which I have to say will last you throughout the entire day. No matter how hard I've tried, I simply couldn't kill the iPhone 6 Plus in just a single day of use, at least at least not with my type of usage. Unfortunately, I cannot say the same thing about the iPhone 6. So, although the iPhone 6 Plus is not a perfect phone or a perfect phablet, it's definitely Apple's first approach to the phablet market. And I have to say, it's, it's a pretty good one. Therefore, if you're into the Apple ecosystem and you think the iPhone 6 is simply too small for you, then go ahead and pick up the iPhone 6 Plus. Otherwise, if you simply want a large phone, a phablet, then you should take a look at our phone, such as the Galaxy Note 4, which is a way better option, but I will talk more about that in my Galaxy Note 4 full review, which is coming in a few weeks, so definitely stay tuned for that. But for me personally, the iPhone 6 Plus is simply too big, it's simply too huge, that's why I picked the iPhone 6 as my daily driver. So, thank you all for watching this video, don't forget to hit the like button down there if you have enjoyed this video, it took me quite a few days to make, so yeah, thank you all for watching, don't forget to subscribe to my channel if you want to see more videos like this one, more reviews, including the iPhone 6 review, which is coming on my channel by next week, as well as the iPad 2 review, iPad mini 3 review, and the Nexus 6 and Nexus 9 review, so definitely stay tuned for those videos, I'm Daniel, and I'll see you in my next video. Zenoftech, signing out. Cheers.